our first session for the evening and our first set of speakers are Raghu and Pushpa Palat. They are the authors of Destiny's Child, The Undefeatable Reign of Parakuti Netiyarama. They're also authors of the best-selling book, The Case That Shook the Empire, which was published in 2019. Raghu Palat is a re leading writer on banking, finance, and investments. He's been writing for major financial newspapers, magazines, and journals for the last four decades, and has 45 published books to his credit. Pushpa Palat began her career as a freelance journalist writing for major newspapers. She's been a content writer for several luxury and hospitality brands, and also moved on to writing books. These two writers with such diverse perspectives have come together to write a story that is very dear to their heart, a book on Parukuti Netiyarama, the consort of the Maharaja of Cochin, who was Raghu's great grandmother. Before I call them to the stage, there's a short video we'd like to play, and then you both can come to the stage. Thank you, Paul, for welcoming us to Sarmaya. Thank you, Avehi, for the wonderful introduction and also for making all these arrangements. It's been wonderful interacting with you. And I want to thank Sarmaya Talks for inviting us to talk about Destiny's Child. And thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you very much for coming this evening and making the time. Thank you, everybody. We're really grateful and this is a wonderful opportunity to speak about our latest book, Destiny's Child. Thank you. Destiny's Child is a book which is very close to my heart because it's a story about my great-grandmother, Parakuti Netiyarama, who was the consort of Maharaja Rama Varma, the 16th of Kuchin. She was my great-grandmother great -grandmother from both sides of the family because my father married his first cousin. And my parents were bo born in the hill palace at Triponitra and Parakuti Netiyarama was very involved in the upbringing. When the Maharaja died, Parakuti Netiyarama took my father to Switzerland and to England, a lone woman. She took them to, England, to him to England and Switzerland for his education. I grew up in her houses, in Trishur and in Kunur. And in the book you would see pictures of me in a pram <coughs> and, and she, you know, which she is, and she's standing next to me and also in her house in Trishur. I grew especially close to her because I lost my mother when I was nine years old and she was very involved in bringing me up. So this book is a very emotional story for me. It evoked many emotional uh, memories when I was writing this book. Um, I, I had heard of Bharukuti Netya Rama from my mother uh, before I had married Raghu and uh, she had talked about the strong, determined, uh, you know, uh, uh, powerful woman who, uh, actually, no, Nair woman, <laughs> that's very important to us because I'm a Nair and we are all, you know, my family are all Nair, so Nair woman. And um, so I had heard of her before I married Raghu. Then I married Raghu and then his relatives and the family were starting to talk about her and I started to getting, you know, they talked about her with great admiration. But I began to realize from my interactions with them that their experiences uh, showed Parvati in, in, in different colors. She seemed a very, you know, a woman of different hues. Um, you know, a, a, a woman that, uh, you know, I mean, she was just not one dimensional. She was larger than life for definitely. She was da larger than life. And then over the years, we met other people and they also uh, told us about Parukuti's contributions to Cochin. Well, in, in fact, even till last week, last week we were being interviewed <coughs> regarding our earlier book. 
the case that shook the empire, which uh, was written uh, about Sarsi Shankaran Nair. And those two interviewers knew so much about her. They had heard of her from their parents and their grandparents. And they just knew much more than maybe we did. And in fact, they told us about her uh, contribution to Chotanikara, the temple, Chotanikara. This is a big temple in, in Kerala. And uh, to the Deepasthambam, you know, which is uh, the... In you Gurvayur. Know, in Gurvayur, which is a, it's a la large golden pillar. She and uh, Sir Nair had been responsible for this pillar. So they knew so much. And you know, it was amazing that, what, it's 90 years? 90, 90 years, years since 90 the end. years since the end of Maharaja Ramavarma the 16th reign and Parakutis. And yet, people talk about her, talk about her achievements, talk about her contribution. Now, this I found amazing. And I'll tell you why I found it amazing, because uh, when I was a kid, and I used to go to Kerala around in the 60s, let's say, and uh, with my parents, I used to find that there were women, you know, who used to stand behind the door and look, peep out from behind the curtain when there were guests in the living room. And I used to always find that very strange because, uh, you know, I used to wonder why they didn't come in, out into the living room. Forget the 60s. In the mid-80s, Raghu, myself and Divya, my daughter, eldest daughter Divya, she's going to be reading for us, but you'll meet her later. But she, three of us had gone to Kerala and we were sitting in the living room and the, 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 they were, we were, you know, offered tea and biscuits. And uh, Divya, who was about two years old, grabbed a whole handful of biscuits and started munching away very happily. Now, we didn't think of it, uh, you know, we didn't even notice it actually. But the very next day, my mother called and she said, Divya's behavior was noticed and noted and regarded as not being particularly uh, feminine, not particularly, <laughs> you know, girl-like. Now, this was in the mid-80s, as I said. And here was this woman from the early 20th century you know, who had brought in legislation, she had spoken her mind, she had headed committees, uh, she had broken so many social norms. And in fact, she was known for it even today. Now, how could I not want to write about her? I've always wanted to write about Parukuti Nitya Rama. Yeah, we'd like to invite Divya. You yes, know, Divya, please just do a little small reading. She'll do a small reading which will give you an idea of the, you know, the, the strength of character, the grit that this lady had. I do more than in business. Okay, so, uh, this is a piece from the book. On the day of the ceremony, as they were leaving the Patricia Stamps for the wedding day, a messenger approached Parvati. <coughs> he had been sent by the Sanarika Narayan Kishiro. The moment she saw the messenger, her heart sank. Intuitively, she felt that something was very wrong. With some trepidation, Parvati tore open the envelope, ripping the royal seal. Her worst fear had come true. Kuni Kidabu had suffered a diabetic stroke and was in very critical condition. All of a sudden, her mind was flooded with memories of her very first meeting with Kuni Kidabu. He had been here at Trichu, at Elena Raja's palace. It was there that he had made her parade up and down the veranda so he could get a better look at her. When after their sambandham, he told her of this, she had feigned indignation and retorted that she would never have acquiesced to such an absurd request had she not been so young and naive. They ended up laughing heartily about the incident. Now, Kunyi Kidavu was very, very sick and she was far away, feeling helpless and alone. Pulling herself together, she glanced up for the note that the messenger had brought and showing absolutely no emotion, she said, it is almost time for the Mahuratam. Let us proceed quickly. Parukuti was first and foremost the consort of the Maharaja of Cochin. Her son, the prince, was about to be married. This was not a time for the display of emotions. Besides, it was important that no one be made aware of the Maharaja's condition. Her duty as the consort of the Maharaja lay in being present at her son's Sambandam until the ceremony was completed. The Sambandam had to go exactly as planned. Thank you, Divya. Thank you. Thank you very much. I must, uh, you know, in case there was some confusion, Kunji Kiravo was the pet name of Maharaja Ramavarma the 16th because all the Tambarans, the princes were either called Rama, 
Kerala or Ravi. And so all of them had another name, a pet name, so that they could be differentiated. Okay, unlike Pushpa, I never really thought about writing about Parakuti Nethyarama. She was my great-grandmother, Valyama. She was someone who was always there. It so happened that after my elder daughter Divya married Aditya, my younger daughter Nikila said she wanted to know her roots. So, because of that, we went to Cochin. And the day we arrived in Cochin, that afternoon we went to the Dutch Palace oh, yes. of Matanjali. Oh yes, let me tell you about the Dutch Palace. Sorry, one sec. Yeah, of course. You walk up those steps to the, that was his first visit to the Dutch Palace. You walk up those steps and there's this long hall and there was this big painting, I mean, portrait of Maharaja Ramabharma the 16th. Big, uh, you know, fabulous portrait. And you know, I think I was taken aback and Nikola and I were both very impressed by this. <laughs> we had never seen such a thing, so we were very impressed, I must say. <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah. carry on. And fortu fortunately, <laughs> The, the curator of the museum was there, Mr. Jadav, and he took us to his office and gave us some tea and regaled us with stories about that period when he knew who we were and uh, told us about their reign and he told us many stories about Parukuti Nethyarama. And he spoke with her with a lot of respect, a lot of awe and admiration and it was delightful. And the 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 cake in the the, cake, the thing was that as we were leaving, he gave us a photograph of Parakuti Nethyarama, a photograph which we had we didn't have in our family collection, and it's reproduced in the book. The next day, we went to the Hill Palace, and uh, the, the authorities in the Hill Palace were also very very kind. They opened doors to us which were normally locked gave us access to rooms and allowed us to take as many pictures as we wanted. And as you know, so many museums don't allow you to take pictures within. They allowed us. And this was also a very nostalgic visit for me because as I mentioned earlier, my father and my mother were brought up there and they had their you know, formative years there. So while I was wandering through those rooms, I did wonder in which room they were born. And then as we walked through the gardens, the extensive gardens at the palace, I remembered stories which my father and my mother had told me about the games they played. They had several cousins who came and played with them. One of these cousins was a boy called Balan, who grew up later to become the world-renowned Swami Chinmayananda. Yes, yes. <laughs> And so I realized after visiting the palace, this was also my first visit to the palace, I realized why my dad never took me there even though I had persist, persistently asked him to because he remembered it in its grandeur as the residence of the Maharaja and he didn't want to dim that memory in any way. Later, when I went to, you know, because we were in this, this quest to find our roots, I spoke to several people in Triponitra, to the princes, members of the royal family, to others in Cochin, in Trishur and Ernakulam, and they all spoke very, very highly of her. It was then that I realized and I felt, yes, I should write about her and, you know, I write a book about her. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Parukuti Nethyarama. She was a feisty feminist. Now, when she was young, as a little girl, she hadn't received much of an education. She knew Malayalam and dance. Not dance, sorry, music. music that was music, it. Music, music, music. Just Malayalam and music. Uh, not much of an education. So, all the education that she received was after her sambandham. Now, the, uh, her father had arranged a sambandham with this particular prince because he was rather progressive. And she, he wanted his daughter to reach the maximum of her potential. He believed that she could do much more. And yes, the prince was very progressive. So uh, on one of their tours, they went first to Madras. And there, the Rani of Pudukote took um, uh, Parakuti around the city of Madras. They were driving down uh, Mount Road in their horse carriage when they passed Higginbotham's. Higginbotham's is a bookshop. And the Rani very casually read the name, which was in English, Higginbottoms. 
Now, Parukuti was just 15 years old then. She was most impressed by the Rani and that she could read English so fluently. And so she decided that she had to learn English. So she pestered the prince and he taught her English. I mean, he not, didn't do that. He set up, had tutors come in to teach her English. But he also insisted that she learn agriculture and mathematics. These were his passions. He was a financial wizard. And also all his investments were basically in land and crop, as it was in those days. So he wanted her inputs. He had realized that she's, you know, very sharp, very bright. And he wanted her inputs. He wanted her her opinion and he wanted to know, get her advice as it was. So he, she, she did do, learn these two subjects. She also studied Sanskrit because he was a Sanskrit scholar and they studied the scriptures together. The prince also had studied Ayurveda and he used to actually treat patients. A lot of people came with snake bites in those days, but he used to treat them. So, you know, and he used to take payment for this. Now, this again was unusual for a prince because the princes got allowances and they were generous allowances and they didn't need to look elsewhere for an income. But as, as I said earlier, this prince was different and he also earned him. He had many sources of income. One very interesting study he had made was called Gavli Shastra. Now, Gavli Shastra is the study of lizards, the sound that the lizards make. You know that, that click, click, click sound they make? Okay, from that sound, he could tell the immediate future. So very often, he would ask Parakuti to, you know, get out some uh, herbs and start grinding them because a patient would be coming very soon who required this particular medication. So theirs was a wonderful partnership. They worked together uh, in unity. They were if fiercely loyal to each other. They uh, trusted and depended on each other. It was a partnership of equals. Uh, a partnership of equals, which even in those days was very unusual. Even today, let's forget it. I mean, forget about those days, early 20th century. But even today, that kind of partnership was difficult, is difficult to find. But that was the kind of partnership sh she had with her spouse. Now, she, Parukuti realized that it was with the education that she could help her husband with what his business and all his activities. So she realized it was then that she, she realized the power of education. Now, once she realized the power of education, she wanted to make certain that every Malayali girl has the right to education, that education is accessible to them. So she built more schools, she gave scholarships, she used to give midday meals, anything to encourage families to send their girl child to school. She built a uh, women's college. Education for the girl was very important to her. Another very important aspect about uh, Parakuti is that she believed that women understood the pulse of the society and what they needed much more, much better than men. And she therefore felt that women must be, must be involved, women should be involved in ref any kind of reform and legislation. And so she was insistent that they become part of the legislative uh, council. Uh, absolutely. You know, Cochin was one of the first states to have an elected legislative council. And in the first constituent assembly, there was a woman. Her name was Thotakad Maladi Amma. As Pushpa mentioned, she was also very involved in child education, because girls women's education, education girls' education, because she wanted them to be educated and at the time when Raja Ram, Maharaja Ram Arma ascended the throne, there were only two schools for girls in Cochin state, in Ernakulam and in Trishur. By the end of their reign, there was a school for girls in every single town and taluk in the state. The number of, the percentage of girls educated rose from 20% to 66.4% during that period. And the amount spent on education was 18.7% of the budget. That's massive. It's one-fifth of the budget went on just education. Another thing, the reign of uh, Maharaja Rama Varma the 16th and Parakuti Netiyarama would be remembered for is the magnificent Cochin Harbour. It was they who convinced Lord Willingdon, who was the governor of Madras at that time, 
that Cochin would have a, which would make a magnificent harbour. Lord Willingdon came, inspected Cochin, and then sent Robert Bristow. And today, Cochin has one of the best harbours in the country. And an added bonus, Willingdon Island was created when this harbour was built. But what she is most remembered for is for a revolutionary reform. It was the first social reform in Kerala, in Cochin, which was the uh, Cochin Nair Regulation of 1920. The Nairs follow a matrilineal system where uh, descent is traced to a common ancestress. Now, I, it we detailed and spoken about uh, the matrilineal system in, in the book in detail. So, suffice it to say that under the system, men had no real responsibility for their financial upkeep of their children or their partners, their sambandis. This suited the Nambudris, the priests and the Tampurans, the princes very well because they had sambandams, relationships with Nair women. So they could produce as many children as they wanted and they had no financial responsibility at all. All that devolved on the woman. And even though we were matrilineal, the control of the family assets, the financial assets was in the hands of one man the eldest male member of that family, the Karnavan. And these Karnavans tended to misuse their authorities. There were some, and they spent the money on their, or the family money on their children, their wives, and their nieces and nephews, and not on the rest of the family, to their detriment. By this act, Sambandam was legalized, Men were made responsible for their wives and children. Wives and children became the inheritors of the estate of the man. Polygamy was abolished and the power of the Karnavan was limited. As a consequence of which the Marmakatayam system entirely died. She was also a very tireless social worker. She worked to improve the situation of people, sanitation was improved, health facilities were established. During the terrible uh, Cochin famine of 1919, she saw to it that uh, rice was imported from Burma and kitchens were open for those who could not, who did not have the money to feed themselves. And uh, her social efforts were recognized. King King George V, who was the King Emperor at that time, presented her with the Gold Kaiseri Hind Award. She was one of the few women to get this award. And uh, she was entitled to a 17-gun salute in her own right and was later known as Lady Ramo Varma. So, yeah, over the years we had collected a lot of material on uh, Parvati Netya Rama. We never got around to writing the book. We never got around to writing the book till the lockdown. The lockdown, we were not going out. Nobody was visiting us. It was a very quiet time. There were no interruptions. So we started taking out all the research, going through it, and then we started writing our book. And it took, what, 15, 18 15, months? 15, 15 months, About 15 yeah. months to write the book. We wrote the book in about 15 months. We went through a lot of material, a lot of research material. Raghu loves history, so he's a real history buff. So he, like Manu, <laughs> would read everything about history. So prior to the uh, rain and after the rain, he covered all that in history. But um, I restricted myself <laughs> to his, their rain. But we checked all the facts and uh, then we started writing the book. And I, like I said, it took about 15 months. But if you look through our bibliography, you'll see that it is very, very extensive. Yes, very, it, very is. Extensive. it is. It is. And we were very fortunate because we could access the writings of that period. We access the annual Cochin administration reports for the entire period. We were able to access books written during that period. The progress of Cochin, Kuchi Raja, Tirumanasa, uh, the days that were. We were able to get from the British Library in London letters written by the Diwan, the resident, 
and the agent to the governor general and these book these letters are reproduced in the book we were also able to access videos from the kuchin royal family symposiums which i held annually of that period we were very clear that we were we didn't want this even though she was my grand great grandmother to be a pain on her you know we wanted to present her as a person of flesh and blood with strengths and weaknesses with virtues and vices as a person and that is what we've tried to do in this book yes that's really what we've tried to do though it's a book like he says about his great grandmother we have stuck to the facts and though it is a historical story we have made it into a story what we believe is that we like to write what we call historical novels even our earlier novel the first one uh, the case that shook the empire is written in the same style um though there are many history buffs um there are more people who enjoy a good story even when you look at history buffs there are people who st stick to one era or one region or one country and when you have a there again we get a wider readership if you've written a story so that is why we try to write a story also another thing why we're writing these stories is because we want kerala ruder, rulers to be known known in the rest of india you know if you look at it nobody not even some keralaites know about uh, you know our rulers and our leaders so this is something we're trying to remedy another very important threat, thing we're trying to remedy and which is why we wanted to go to normal you know I mean, not just kerala not stick stick to just keralaites and malayalis we want uh, the rest of india to know that you know what kerala leaders kerala rulers did contribute to the independence movement to the national movement i mean if you look at our history books not a word <laughs> about kerala at all and you know they did like in our last book we did uh, you know show how sir c nair contributed to the independence movement and here too we have uh, shown how uh, there's a little bit about her and how she was a nationalist and how she was one of the first rulers in india to follow gandhi and to want uh, you know to su support yeah. nationalism yeah. now just to sh just to give you a brief thing on that we would like divya once again to come up and read this bit about gandhi ji and uh, Paru parukuti's interaction along with divan narayana ayer parukuti wearing a white khadi sari which she had spun and bereft of any jewelry called on gandhi gandhi had heard that parukuti was a very autocratic and power hungry woman who ruled the state with an iron hand and tolerated no opposition this slightly plump lady in a plain khadi sari was entirely different from what he imagined on meeting the mahatma this powerful woman in the north indian custom bowed down and touched his feet moved beyond words gandhi blessed her and gestured for her to sit next to him she spent the next 2 hours with him Parukuti told the Mahatma how much she believed in his cause and regaled him about all that was being done in her state. She presented him with checks and cash as a gesture of her commitment to independence. Thank you, Divya. Thank, thank you, you, Divya. <clears throat> well, I think that brings yes, us to a close point. Thank you point. so much for giving But us a patient hearing, and we'd love to hear any But questions I, that you have. But before I before we yes. do that, even oh, yes. I need to do one thing, and I I hope you will allow me this. I need to thank my family. I really need to because Devia, you know, has come up and spoken for you know uh, and done the readings and much more. Aditya did that first video which you saw, <laughs> and uh, he has also given us a lot of inputs on how to write our book, which were very useful. I must thank Vivan, my son-in-law from you know the other the other son-in-law. because he's made us look very glamorous on the glamorous on the you know the back, the back flip flap, the back, uh, flap. back flap of the cover i've never looked so glamorous before thank you vivan uh, and then there's nikila my younger daughter who does all our social media posts so i am really blessed to have a team who works for me completely free who i can bully also so i must just i'm sorry i took that time but i really needed to thank them thank you all of you <laughs> <laughs> Oh yes, of course. I have to thank. Most importantly, I have to thank my little baby Nevaya, who we written this book for. The whole book has this been book written has been only for her. There her. she is, my gorgeous. There she is. There she is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're opening the floor for questions, and we have a mic pass. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Raghu and Pushpa ji, for this uh, novel. tell me is kerala kerala was also a polyglot society of the malabar coast because foreign 
Jews, you know, Malab you know, people from the uh, Middle East and all. Did that influence uh, the rulers there uh, uh, to kind of, you know, be more open-minded because of external influences? And maybe Divya can make this book into a play if she chooses. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the Cochin rulers were very uh, open to this. You know, the Jews were welcomed. When the Konkanis were, uh, you know, persecuted, they were, they were welcomed. Muslims were mainly more in the, in the, in, Ka in, the in Calicut and... The, Mal North Malabar. Lord. In the North Malabar, in Calicut, because there was a massive trade between the Arabs and Calicut. But there were, of course, several Muslims in, in Cochin also. Then Cochin was also open to the Chinese. And there was a lot of China trade. Cochin has these, those wonderful Chinese nets. So it was a very open society. You know, it was a very welcoming society there. Yeah, but I think uh, Kerala kept its traditions. They were very, uh, you know, so each uh, community really kept their own identity and nobody kind of interfered with that. They didn't try to, you know, encroach on another person's identity. I think that's how it was a live and let live policy, really. Just making a comment, not a question. Compared to today's proper politicians, you prefer the Maharajas than the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> Be highly debatable. No, I think I, I would tend to say yes because you know, especially the, the you know the southern Maharajas. Yeah, they were. If you really look at them, they they were they distributed their wealth. They were you know they 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 were they were keen on educating the the people. They wanted they had many welfare schemes. They they they, they were not wealthy. In their own, if, you know, especially in Cochin, they were not wealthy. He, the Maharaja received an allowance. Yes. You see, whereas other Maharajas in the north received all the money in taxes, etc., went directly to them. Here, the Maharajas <laughs> received an allowance with which they lived. So there was no surplus. You know, it wasn't like extravagant living in massive, great, you know, palaces and all over. You, the and if you look, you know, if it's it's a very strange situation when India was formed. In 1947, you know, when the Rajas gave up their thrones, yeah. in most other in other, most other states, Maharajas kept kept the, even in Travancore, they kept their palaces and their estates. You know, they gave up the throne. That's all. In Cochin, <laughs> the Maharaja walked out of his palace. All he took was a calendar. calendar. Just Can one you imagine? calendar. He that took was a it. calendar. That was it. That's all he took. So, so they were very, you know. I wanted to ask, uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on this idea of the, of the Sapanda? Were there, were there, were, was there also a sort of a legal spouse um, uh, or, or, or they were all Sapandas? Can you elaborate? Yes, it is given so, in detail in the book. So I'll, you, yeah, you carry want on, to go? Carry on. No, 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 sorry. Okay, Sambandam was, you see, you've got to really look at Nair society at that time. The, the, the Nayas were fighters and they tended, the men tended to be at, uh, you know, at the chief, the, the, the chief's residence, etc. And the women were in their family houses. So, the, the uh, Sambandam was a relationship. Never marriage. And it was not marriage, it was a relationship, it was... Poly, you know, we, and the Nayas had both polygamy and polyandry. But I must point out this. Yeah. Uh, the men may be having lots of uh, partners, but it always happened that 99.9% .9 of the women, and this is a fact, stuck to one partner. Even when there was, uh, you know, uh, the Sambandam going on. And then she legalized Sambandam, which means you could, it will became a marriage. It was only because of this act which is mentioned, that it became a sambandha. And but it, was, it was really promoted by the Nambudris. Yes. Because when you look at the priestly class, because the Nambudris, Namb Nambudris were patrilineal. And only the eldest Nambudri was allowed to marry. Only the eldest in the family was allowed to marry. All the other Nambudri children, men or, and women, were, could, were not allowed to marry. So the men then, so the Nambudris... <laughs> Had uh, you know, you know, had Sambandha with, with Nair, Nair women. women. See, and they were not responsible for the children. There was no were, the the the, the uh, most unfair part is that nobody was responsible for the children except the women. 
See, the women were responsible for the children. That power would have changed completely. So that it was, was also a convenient way of keeping the property intact. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Pro property was kept intact because it just it 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 uh, descended through women, you know, yeah, sort of. That's just, true. And yeah. the family property was always there. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing, of course, was here again that with it, to keep my property within families, you tended to marry your uncle's daughter, as my father did. Yeah. See, my question is not directly related to the book, but since you're talking of matrilineal societies and all that, I just wanted to know whether the Tharavad system is still prevalent in Kerala or has it just disintegrated? No, the Tharavad system in that uh, there is always a Tharavad house mm -hmm. and all members of that Tharavad have right to that property. You can go in any time. So, a Kerala woman will never be without a house. That I can assure you because that Tharavad, but everyone in that Tharavad has the right to the house. So, normally it's not sold, uh, sold because how can you sell with there so many hundreds of people around? Yes, there is a Tharavad house. The Tharavad house remains, but the system of the, you know, the property is all going. Earlier the Tharwad had, you know, everything went, all men, whatever they earned went to the Tharwad. Now no more, you have unit families. But the Tharwad house may be existing in many places. That is the property, that particular property. Unless everybody agrees to sell it and then, you know, but it's there. Such a lovely book. Even your first book, thank which you, I read, thank was you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And we've been watching so many serials and Netflix about the Queen, the Bridgerton. Yes. I wish we would know much more about I your know. books being made into a, I, you know, series. God willing, God willing. God because, willing, it will be. Yeah, because <laughs> there's so much to know about your own country and yes. the states. We don't, yes. we didn't know, yes. and you know, it's a real eye opener. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That's what yeah. we are trying to the do. We to actually, write the, the more first, about Kerala and the South. The first book is being made into a movie. Uh, the oh, case that's that nice. shook, in the, uh, shook the empire on Sasi Shankar and I. Uh, we've been very fortunate with the help of Aditya and Divya to have uh, Karan Johar, uh, oh, uh, Dharma wow. Productions, uh, take on that book. But each book has its own little fate and own little lifeline. Yeah, so, so we, we get to see her jewels then. I hope. <laughs> That's in this book. Not Especially that one. solitary. <laughs> this, this, this book, not that one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Read this Tharawad. In the Kerala Christians, the youngest son inherits the Tharawad because he's expected okay. to look okay. after the parents. All right. You know, that's not there in the Hindu system, no, is it? No, 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 not at all. The Tharwad is the family, it's a, family it's, a fa it's a matrilineal family and every member of the Tharwad has a right, right to, to that property. Right to li li live there, you know. Yeah. Uh, this might come across a little naive, but I was just wondering, you had mentioned that a couple of letters from, you had obtained from the British Library, from the Diwan, right? So could you please expand a little bit upon, like, uh, why would like, the Diwan be talking about like, the Queen? Sorry, I... She wants uh, to know why the Divan was writing letters regarding Cochin, when that Cochin was ruled by that's yeah. Uh, and what, the, what exactly they were talking about uh, the Queen sure, and so on. Sure. The, you know, the, the Divan is effectively the chief minister of the state. He was the chief executive managing the administration. And the, and the, and the Raja was of course the head of the, head of the state. The, the, very often the Divan was a Englishman. That's what and she's asking. Why is, was that? That's what she's asking. Uh, was an Englishman, and he and we, if he wanted to get certain things approved by the Maharaja, he would have you know the, his office would write a letter to the Maharaja. They would of course meet at times, but if he wanted certain things done, he would write to the Maharaja. Or certain times, if he did not get access to the Maharaja, he would write a letter to him asking him for permission or for certain other things. And that is where the letters came. And then the Diwan, when you read the book, you would know there was a conflict. And so there were letters written by the Diwan to the British resident who was, resi who was in charge of both Travancore and Cochin about certain uh, matters. I, w I won't really reveal what the, what the conflict was about. But this is what we have reproduced in the book. The conflict, the issues that were related, 
and you know, and that's why these letters were written. No, the, the Diwan was in the state, was in the state. The Diwan was appointed for a period of time. Very often they were Englishmen, they were also Indians. Yeah, they were, but they needed were the approval of the British, didn't Yes, they, they needed, needed the because it was dependent on the, it was part of Madras, you know, the, the governor of Madras was in charge of Cochin and Travancore. So, why would it have let us, let us be available, wouldn't they be thinking our guys like, why would they See, that's the funny thing, even the pictures, some of the pictures we've got of Sir Shankaran, we got from the... No, I'll tell you, I'll tell you why, the thing is, when these letters were written, they would be, they were written to Madras or later on when it became the agent to the Governor General to Delhi. Now there are copies in the, in the Madras archives, the same letters are also in the, in the Delhi, in, in Delhi. And these letters were also copied and sent to London. So, you know, the, they, made, they made several copies of each letter. So these letters were in, at different places. But now what, London was useful because it was the one place where you could get everything. And it's, you know, actually, this is a sad thing to say, but the British have saved a lot of our history. And, you know, a lot of uh, historians go there and do their research because they have protected what we really should have. It's you more know, accessible, you know. More accessible, yes. Nothing and they else. really actually saved to, everything. We to haven't, to, unfortunately. unfortunately. In order to go to so one of the easier. archives here, you have to get a letter from various people to say you're a scholar or you're doing all kinds of other things in order to be able to even access the archives. It's easier. That's not really yeah. necessary to get letters from the British. It's much easier. You know, even British photographs library. we've got on of our last book, we've got it from there, didn't we? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. And what's from our Indian archive has to access here, so my professors are good from them, why would London be easier? But, you know, if you ask anybody who's doing research on these things, you'll find that they will find it easier. Manu will tell you also, right? Manu, you agree with that, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sorry, could we take one last question from somebody else? I think Anna Henry is there. Paul. How much of uh, Cochin's ethos was defined by them being stuck in between two, uh, a larger Travancore and a more uh, colonial Malabar? Sorry, I didn't... They uh, were, Cochin was between Travancore, you know, yeah, yeah. it did affect them very... You know. Oh, it affected them very much. Because if you really re read the, you know, the history of Cochin, Cochin was one of the largest countries at one point of time. You know, when I say Cochin, the... The original thing was Perimpadupu Swarupam. And he had 4,000, and the, so the kingdom was 4,000 square miles. Travancore started, at least uh, Calicut started with, with the area that one could hear from a cock crow, and then the, the Zamorins conquered most of that place until Cochin became very small. And then later on in Travancore with Martanda Varma, he again captured a lot of Cochin. So, Cochin once large, you know, both these uh, kingdoms affected the size of Cochin and they fought against Cochin considerably until the British finally came and, and there was peace among all these uh, kingdoms. Yeah, but and even then fight with regard them. to the, hmm? you know, with regard to the railroad and all, there was a lot of uh, opposition. There was you. opposition, like, you know, when the railroad from Shornur to Cochin was to be built, it had to pass through Travancore territory, and the Maharaja of Travancore did not. The Maharaja of Travancore did not allow it to, it to be built by Cochin, and then it had to be done by a Madras company. They did not contribute to the Cochin Harbour being built. You know, there yes, was there was a lot like of this. yeah. There was difficulties. There was. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so. you. Thank you both so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Subscribe to Sarmaya and be a part of the stories and conversations around art, history and culture.